Chapter 9 Caves In early 1964, after two inspiring years serving a John Cowell, I resumed my wanderings in the wilds of the Northeast. I had my heart set on paying my respects to other highly acclaimed disciples of a John Mond who resided in the area. A John such as a John Tate de Sarungsi, a John Fun Acharo, a John Kumdi Pabaso, and a John On Yana Siri. Thus I embarked on a lengthy pilgrimage to pay homage to these great meditation masters in the forest monasteries where they lived. For two years I wandered by stages across the wind-swept and sparsely populated northeastern landscape, camping beneath shady trees and receiving food from the poor rice farmers who lived along my route. When bone-numbingly cold winds began blowing down from the north in December of 1965, I started hiking south toward the warmer weather that lingered on the central plains. I planned to eventually make my way back home to Chantaburi. News had reached me that my mother's chronic intestinal problems had gotten progressively worse while I was away, and I wanted to contribute to her recovery. Upon my return, I resumed my old position as abbot of Crystal Mountain Monastery. This time, I was determined to bring my mother to the monastery so that she could spend the rainy season retreat period with me. When I noticed that her condition seemed somewhat improved, I took the opportunity to broach the subject with her. I went to her house to offer the invitation. When she voiced skepticism, I pleaded with her to join me at the monastery for three months of merit-making and meditation. She insisted she was too sick to spend three months away from home. I tried to bargain with her, suggesting first a two-month stay, then a one-month stay. But in the end, she agreed to stay at the monastery for only ten days. From the very first day, I sensed my mother was annoyed with me. She resisted my overtures to help integrate her into the monastic routine. It appeared that she intended to stake out her independence from my chosen way of life and she thought she had good reason. She quickly started to criticize what she felt to be my uncouth speech and behavior. After living alone and carefree in wilderness habitats for the past several years, I felt awkward playing the role of abbot once again and acting with the customary decorum expected of a monk of my seniority. This wild monkey that had swung from branch to branch through the jungle, beholden to no one and unconcerned with praise or censure, was now confronted by the norms of civilized society. Free from the dictates of socially acceptable rules and conventions, I had lived in the wilderness exactly as I chose, obedient to no necessities except for those imposed by wind and rain, and certainly not to those of the world of commonplace manners and customs. My robes were torn and frayed, lacking in color and freshness, my sunburned features, with chapped hands and thickly calloused feet, were an eyesore. Coarse, uncouth, and too direct, my speech was graceless and offensive. The monkey appeared rude. He had no table manners. In everyday conversations, I sometimes punctuated my speech with colorful expressions that some people considered to be vulgar. I tended to use crude and coarse language and inject swear words into discussions at the monastery. I might call someone a jackass or a damn fool in response to the circumstances at that moment. If I saw someone misbehaving, I might yell out, you crazy idiot, or stop that shit, just to wake them up and get their full attention. Other expletives I uttered were perhaps too vulgar to mention here. Those robust responses were effective because all talking would stop after I spoke, and people would pay attention. They knew that the issue was important to me and that I meant business, and their reactions reflected that. I believe in being polite and encouraging when the circumstances warrant it. But sometimes, vulgar speech provides a little extra grease on the wheels, not that my mother could have understood that reasoning. My mother soon began pleading with me to be more cultured and polite in my speech. Otherwise, people would criticize me for tarnishing my status as a celebrated senior monk. Being a gentle person, she was offended by vulgar language. Besides that, she felt embarrassed for me. She told me she knew I had a heart of gold on the inside. So why couldn't that good nature show on the outside, too? Why on earth did I insist on talking like that? I was a monk 
How come I didn't know the difference between what was appropriate and what was not? Frustrated, she occasionally wrung her hands and lamented that I tended to speak without any restraint. I tried to explain that I couldn't help it. It was instinctive, just part of the provincial dialect that I grew up speaking. True to my character, I became fluent in the salty language of the southeastern seashore fishermen. I'd always included a lot of common vulgarisms in my speech. Cursing playfully was common among the rowdy bunch I used to hang out with. We called each other every name in the book. But we just laughed about it. No one took offense. Among friends, they were words expressing a kind of affection. It was also common for village folk to keep up a foul-mouthed banter, especially when the older men addressed the younger ones. Respect for age and experience made it acceptable and even endearing. In terms of my age and my status as a monk, I felt a similar right and privilege. Most people were amused by my unsavory choice of words, although sometimes the monks and the women did profess embarrassment. My mother had long been an honored and well-respected member of Shantaburi society. With that status came a sense of pride and a feeling of dignity which she was determined to uphold despite her son's foul-mouthed behavior. She grudgingly tolerated me as mothers are wont to do with willful children. Although she disavowed my mannerisms, she never turned her back on me. I loved my mother dearly and didn't intend to cause her grief, but my natural instincts usually carried the day. I nevertheless made every effort to show gratitude to my mother as a way to pay back the lifetime of kindness she bestowed on me. On lunar observance days, a group of lay people, mostly women from the towns and cities across the region, congregated at the monastery's pavilion in the evening to hear me give a Dhamma talk. My Dhamma teaching theme never changed for those sessions. I would always stress the importance of body contemplation, though I'd usually start off with the virtues of the repetition of Budo. Budo is an exercise in ridding the mind of discursive thinking so that it becomes clear, sharp, and attentive. There's no need to vocally intone the word or be concerned with trying to visualize anything. The objective is to eliminate mental distractions. It's not necessary to evoke a special attitude of devotion to the Buddha. Just focus on bud, do, bud, do in quick succession. The faster the repetition, the less likely it is that thoughts will find the space to sneak in edgeways. Rapid-fire repetition of Budo can generate enough mindfulness to rein in the mental restlessness that drives wandering thoughts, allowing them to gradually calm down and go quiet. Once the mind is sufficiently calm and quiet, conjure up a mental image of the physical body and start to meticulously dissect that image piece by piece, layer by layer. Taking the body to pieces is the most effective way to investigate it. I know this from personal experience. I always teach this type of body contemplation because I've seen how well it works. I told people to begin by dismembering the human body from head to toe. I first drew their attention to the head and went through its various parts. I instructed them to visualize the right eye and pull it out from its socket, then do the same with the left eye, and then place both on the pavilion floor. Imagine tearing away the right and left nostrils and throwing those on the floor. Rip off the ears, the cheeks, and the lips, then pull out all the teeth. Chuck that lot on the floor with the rest. Move on to the hands and feet and use the mental image of a sharp knife to chop off the fingers and toes, one digit at a time, and add that to the bloody heap in front of you. Using the same imaginary knife on the abdomen, Peel back the skin and cut through the bands of muscle to expose the internal organs, the heart, liver, kidneys, and intestines, for example. Yank them out one at a time in the mind's eye, then examine them for insight as you dice them into small pieces with the sharp blade. Now scatter the pieces across the floor and wonder, where in this disgusting mess am I? Where in it do I feel at home? Why do I carry this bloody burden around with me all the time? This is the gist of the Dhamma talk that I always gave on lunar observance days. I rarely deviated from that basic theme. 
The frequent use of this topic prompted my old friend Ajahn Fuang to confront me one day during a visit to the monastery. He accused me of teaching only one kind of meditation, regardless of who was in the audience. It was always chopping up body parts and scattering them front and center on the floor. No wonder no one wanted to listen to my Dhamma talks. There was only one style, one kind of talk, year after year. Why couldn't I tone it down a bit? Most people only wanted to hear something that made them relax and feel happy before going back to their family life. Women were particularly disgusted hearing about filthy body parts. It turned their stomachs. Why did I always insist on teaching women body contemplation? Ajahn Fuang recommended that I reserve this kind of intensive Dhamma investigation for my own practice instead. He felt it was inappropriate to introduce such practices to the general public. On this subject, Ajahn Fuang and I disagreed. But don't be misled. A disagreement between practicing monks on points of Dhamma is not an argument in the ordinary sense of the word. It is a difference of opinion from which both can learn and benefit. In fact, I heard complaints from many different people that my teachings were too harsh. Women were different, I was told. They came to listen to a smooth, eloquent discourse that would soothe their troubled minds. They weren't interested in attaining enlightenment. Why did I always insist on teaching women body contemplation? My answer to those people was, how could women be any different from men with respect to meditation practice? Men are human beings. Women are as well. We needn't doubt that for a moment. Men and women are not the same in appearance. We all know that. But there is not a whisker of difference between the sexes when it comes to their essential minds. So don't be deluded by superficial impressions. When we say, this is a man or this is a woman, those designations result from the arising of thought. In deep samadhi, where thought does not arise, attributes like man or woman do not exist. That should make it clear that no distinction exists between the conscious awareness of women and that of men. There is no reason, then, to doubt that women are fully capable of succeeding at all types of meditation. No grounds exist whatsoever for saying women can't become enlightened. If they really couldn't, what would I gain by going around lying about it to everyone? Women also have dirty parts, so it's only right that they should investigate those parts until they become disgusted and dismayed with physical existence, and thus motivated to relieve the mind of that heavy burden. I simply teach them the unvarnished truth. It's up to them to find the inner strength needed to face up to it. When I sat on the high seat in the pavilion teaching the people who came to meditate, some of them criticized me for scratching my crotch in public. They thought it very unbecoming of a monk to dig his fingernails into his private parts in full view of the assembly. They turned their heads away and cried foul. What was I supposed to do? The body itches when and where it chooses, and I scratch it to get some relief. It's as simple as that. If my ass itched, I'd scratch that too. Why should I feel awkward or embarrassed? So what if they're considered dirty places? The whole damn body is a dirty place that itches here and there following the causes and conditions of birth as a human being. I might as well be embarrassed about having arms and legs or hands and feet. When I fart or belch in public, it causes a stir. He's a monk, how dare he? It is as though these are somehow unorthodox behaviors. Farting is just a natural reflexive action of the bowels. Regardless of how it comes out, stomach gas makes a noise. This embarrassment occurs because people are so obsessed with bodies that they don't want to face the truth about them. In their minds, they divide out the shameful, dirty parts from the admirable clean ones and pretend everything is fine, provided that everyone blindly follows the rules of social etiquette. Social customs certainly have their merits, but they mask a deeper reality about perceptions of the human body, which are characterized by a preference for beauty and attractiveness over ugliness and repugnance. These perceptions are deeply personal and conveniently go unquestioned to protect the preferred image. 
It is strange that people identify with and desire something as gross and repulsive as the human body. They can do so only by completely ignoring the realities of flesh and blood. I trained monks to practice the same method that I taught the lay people, though usually in more graphic detail. I always began by stressing the importance of disciplined behavior and focused attention. Without a strong foundation in discipline and powerful concentration, a monk's meditation was bound to falter when the practice intensified. Contemplating the body could resemble grabbing a tiger by the tail. Only those fully dedicated to the training had any real hope of taming the beast. On this topic, my talks often became animated. To hell with being content to create a comfortable cell in the oppressive prison of Sungsara, break out of the confinement of attachment to the body, and savor the freedom of never returning to the fetters of physical existence again. Free the spirit from the web of bodily attraction, refuse to settle for a life of bondage and incarceration. The monks needed to learn the monastic rules of conduct as well as bold meditation techniques. In terms of monastic discipline, I was strict and meticulous. I schooled every monk who came to me for guidance and reprimanded monks severely when they violated the rules, whether they respected me for it or not. At the very least, I intended to maintain a high standard within the monastery. Monks were expected to follow even the lesser, unwritten rules of conduct. For instance, if I noticed two monks walking together and chatting, I immediately scolded them for wasting time and sent them straight back to their huts to meditate. Idle chatter was typical behavior of lay people, and it had no place in a practice monastery. Some monks were exemplary in carrying out their daily duties and responsibilities, only to later spend hours together fooling around. I chastised such monks when I caught them. I reckon I got better results meditating for the short time it took me to urinate than they did meditating all night. I taught the monks to be frugal with their requisites, and I led by example. Lay supporters worked hard, sacrificing their time and energy to provide monks with basic necessities. Forest monks were expected to keep those items in good condition, and when necessary, repair them to prolong their usefulness. They were expected to patch old robes that were torn or worn thin, and not just sit around idly waiting for lay folks to offer new robes to replace them. They mended holes in time-worn bowl bags, shoulder bags, and belts to keep them functional. Monks who acted responsibly with their requisites were content to make do with little. They knew how to live in humble circumstances and were happy to make use of second-hand items or maintain the usefulness of well-worn ones. Dutanga monks take pride in mending their robes time and time again until the cloth looks like a patchwork of fabrics and stitches. I insisted that my monks learn how to skillfully sew their robes by hand, using the needles and thread included in their basic requisites. Hand sewing was a very useful skill for Dutanga monks because it allowed them to easily mend cloth items when they were wandering and camping in the wilderness. I didn't want monks to be dependent solely on the monastery's sewing machines to make or repair their garments. I had learned from a John Mon lessons in salvaging old cloth and other useful items that people threw away when they lost interest in them. For example, while walking on the country roads, I occasionally found an old, worn-out pair of pants or some other garment cast away on the side of the road. I thankfully picked up the obviously ownerless item from the ground and carried it back to the monastery where it could be washed and fashioned into small cloth requisites, patches for robes, or just foot rags. If I spied bent nails on the ground, I'd retrieve them, hammer them straight, and put them away for future use. A broken plastic bucket could be cut into pieces, and with a little innovation, shaped into a sheath to cover the blade of a machete or a hatchet. If I saw a damaged pillow or cushion cast in the drain in front of a house in the village when on alms round, I ordered a junior monk walking behind me to pick it up and carry it back with him. The poor monk would feel embarrassed clutching a damaged and soiled pillow along with his clean alms bowl. People must have thought he was crazy. When we returned to the monastery, I would have the monk take the stuffing from the cushion and spread it out in the sun to dry. 
He would then wash the cloth casing, patch it if necessary, and put the stuffing back inside. In the process, he would learn a valuable lesson. Don't be wasteful. Treasure the lowliest acquisitions. This is the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether one has plenty or just barely enough. Fine requisites themselves are not a true source of contentment and can easily become a source of discontent for a heart that lacks Dhamma principles to sustain it. Unsupported by Dhamma and left to its own desires, the heart will be unable to experience genuine happiness, even with a mountain of valuable possessions at its disposal. Regardless of whether a monk wears robes patched with rags or brand new robes, he must be satisfied with what he has and trust the power of the virtues he has developed to provide for the future. When craving leads the way, sought-after belongings end up being accumulated waste, which is useless for spiritual development. Ultimately, the monks who hoard these belongings turn their monasteries into wastelands of greed and desire. I wasn't going to allow that to happen at Crystal Mountain Monastery. When I moved back to Crystal Mountain Monastery in early 1966, I resolved to live there and assist my mother to the best of my ability for the remainder of her life. My mother was a very noble, kind, and respectable person. I loved her very much. I knew that she always had me on her mind. She had wanted me to be an active part of the family and trusted me to dedicate merit for her well-being after she passed away. Her death occurred on March 17, 1974, when she was 93 years old. I miss her to this day. Her cremation took place several days after her death. An open-air cremation pyre was built on a flat area in front of the main pavilion inside Crystal Mountain Monastery. I invited several highly respected disciples of Ajahn Mon to assist with the funeral arrangements and give Dhamma talks to the gathering of well-wishers attending the ceremony. After my mother's ashes had been gathered from the cremation site and dutifully distributed among members of the family, my filial responsibilities had been fulfilled. I was then released from further obligations and could roam freely again. After leaving Crystal Mountain Monastery, I trekked north through the country's central plains until I reached the Khao Yai mountain range that separates the central and northeastern regions of Thailand. I wandered Dutanga alone in the Dong Paya Yen forest for a few months before making my way south to Bangkok. There I stayed at Asokarama Monastery, a monastery built by my mentor Ajahn Lee in the marshy Chao Praya River estuary district on the outskirts of the city. It was a quiet and isolated location close to where the Chao Praya River empties into the Gulf of Thailand. The main section of the monastery was built on high ground, but as more monks' residences were added over the years, construction began to stretch out into the swampy coastal tidewater area alongside the river. The huts there were built on stilts to protect them against rising water levels and were connected by elevated walkways which nearly flooded at high tide. The monks living at Asokarama Monastery were more urbane and studious than those I had been accustomed to teaching. Many of the senior monks were learned Pali scholars who showed little interest in meditation practice and their students tended to follow their example. Undeterred by their apparent indifference, I gathered a group of young monks around me and instructed them in the basics of meditation. They were still required to spend their days pursuing academic studies, but in the evening, I brought them together for Dhamma discussions and meditation sessions. Eventually, the abbot of the main royally sponsored Dhammayut monastery in Bangkok, Somdet Nyana Sangwara, whom I had visited from time to time in the past, came to me with a proposal. He had long been an enthusiastic advocate for the forest monastic tradition. He appreciated its emphasis on putting the Buddha's teachings into practice in secluded environments. He felt that monks who ordained in Bangkok monasteries would be best served if they had the option to choose a lifestyle focused on meditation as an alternative to one focused primarily on academic studies. In conjunction with the senior monks at Asokarama Monastery, we discussed the possibility of establishing a monastic retreat center in the coastal region southeast of Bangkok, 
where monks from the urban monasteries who wished to practice meditation in earnest could take up residence and train under the guidance of an experienced teacher. Knowing my background from our previous conversations, Somdet Nyana Sangwara proposed that I supervise the project and take responsibility for the training program. When I agreed to participate, the group appointed a committee to search for an appropriate piece of land. As a result, two of Somdet Nyana Sangwara's wealthy patrons purchased and generously donated 150 acres of land situated adjacent to another 1,000 acres of vacant farmland owned by the Thai king. The nascent monastery was given the name Nyana Sangwara. In December 1976, I moved to Nyana Sangwara Monastery and took up residence there together with my monastic students from Asokarama Monastery. Only a few small huts were available to us at first, but with the help of local villagers we set to work building enough simple residences to house us all. Once we had completed the building of an open-air pavilion and all the monks' huts, I discontinued the construction work and concentrated on instituting a daily monastic routine conducive to full-time meditation similar to the one that Ajahn Mun had established. If I had failed to institute a rigorous routine early on, it would have been hard to reverse the tendency to simply take it easy. All monks were required to wake up promptly at 3 a.m., climb down from their huts, and begin doing walking meditation. I walked around the monastery at that hour every morning to make sure that all the monks were awake and meditating. When I found a darkened hut and a vacant meditation path, I cleared my throat, softly at first. If I didn't hear a response, I'd cough loudly and spit on the ground. If the silence continued, I'd take off one of my sandals and bang it on the wall of the hut, shouting a few choice words to accompany the noise and rouse the sleeping monk. Before dawn, we all congregated at the pavilion to scrub and sweep the floor in preparation for walking to town for alms. Because the nearest town was far away, we started walking early in order to reach it shortly after the first light of dawn. Our destination was a small market town of noodle shops and seafood stores where the daily food offerings that we received were more than sufficient for our needs. After a long walk back to the monastery, we arranged the food in our bowls and sat down to eat. I stressed moderation in eating. For practicing monks, less is always better than more. After the meal, bowls were washed and dried in the sun, the pavilion was cleaned again, and everything was put neatly away in its proper place. The monks then carried their personal items back to their huts and promptly began doing walking meditation. When we first moved to the new monastery, very few shady trees grew on the property, so the monks were obliged to pace back and forth under the hot sun. The land had originally been the site of a prosperous cassava plantation, but the flat fields were now bare of vegetation and furrowed from years of plowing. This presented significant challenges to our efforts to develop a forest monastery. With the help of local labor, we started a forest reclamation project by planting hundreds of native trees, first at regular intervals around the monastic buildings and later across the full breadth of the property. To combat a chronic scarcity of water, I instituted a water conservation policy. All wastewater, whether from washing bowls and robes or from bathing, was collected in such a way that the excess ended up watering the vegetation. No water was to be wasted. Even urine was collected and poured at the base of the young saplings. As a result of this effort, the forest re-entered the monastery, one seedling at a time. As dusk fell each evening, we all gathered again at the central pavilion. A Dhamma talk preceded seated meditation that lasted until I brought it to a close, after which I sent everyone back to their huts to rest for the night. The early morning meditation routine started again at 3 a.m. The monks from Asakarama Monastery were not accustomed to such an intense lifestyle. They often stumbled out of their huts at that early hour, staggered over to the meditation path, and experienced difficulty walking mindfully until mind and body became fully awake. 
I drilled them in the training methods that I had practiced under Ajahn Mond's skillful guidance, methods that go against the grain by forcing meditators to confront their mental hindrances head-on to prevent them from falling prey to a complacent sense of self-satisfaction. Through repeated and regular repetition of the same practice, a monk's meditation can remain consistent and predictable. But the effects of that mode of practice can result in a lack of sharpness and clarity, especially when one's meditation habitually settles for a succession of calm and gentle states of mind, followed by timid insight investigations day after day. The familiarity of these practices makes practitioners feel deceptively at ease and comfortable with their meditation. They feel at ease because their minds are not being tested. They remain stuck in the same old rut, and they can't rouse the courage to change course because change means uncertainty and discomfort. When life feels safe and familiar, finding the motivation to step into a challenging situation can seem daunting. It requires focused willpower and a radically different mindset. The demanding meditation practices that Ajahn Mond and his disciples pioneered were designed to strike a blow against such complacency by awakening the mental strength and focused energy needed to seek out the most challenging environments while engaging in those practices that require the most skill and effort. Jnana Sungwara Monastery's physical landscape was open and free of danger. No wild animals roamed the countryside. No mental vigilance was required to feel secure. Thus, it was my job to establish a mental landscape within each monk that forced him to face the unpleasant realities of the human condition as a way of awakening him to his potential for experiencing states of clear, heightened awareness that could illuminate the mental dangers he must contend with. There were no wild animals to threaten the monk's safety, but wild defilements still roamed freely in their minds, harrowing in their potential for mauling the unsuspecting victim. Freedom from fear and anxiety meant trapping and eliminating the beasts of greed, aversion, delusion, and sexual craving. To drive this point home to my students, my teachings often stress the dangers of sexual craving. Because no other emotion defiles the mind so thoroughly, sexual craving is a root cause in the perpetuation of the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. The only way to make sure one will never take birth on this earth again is to uproot and destroy all traces of sexual craving. No other defilement weighs more heavily on the mind or exerts greater power over it than this form of craving. This defilement is one of the most significant obstacles to a monk's progress in meditation. The more deeply the body is probed and investigated, the more evident this truth becomes. Since hunger for sexual gratification is rooted in perceptions of the human body, Exposing the body's repulsive reality will gradually diminish the mind's infatuation with bodily attraction. How does the body, which is just a stinking bag of flesh, blood, and bones, manage to deceive everyone in the world into lusting after it? Only body contemplation can expose the nature of that deception. I told the monks that skin is the chief deceiver. Because it encases the body from head to toe, it's the visible part that is always on display. But what does it conceal? It conceals the animal flesh, the muscles, the fluids, and the fat. It hides from view the skeleton with the tendons and the sinews. It covers the liver, the kidneys, the stomach, the intestines, and all the other internal organs. The human body's innards are not things of beauty worthy of passion and lust. Instead of being fooled by a thin layer of scaly tissue, peel it off to see what lies hidden underneath. Seeing the body clearly and precisely in a way that leaves no room for doubt demands boldness and persistence. Investigating the body from time to time, only when in the mood, isn't enough. This practice must be approached as if it is a monk's life work, as though nothing else in the world matters except the analysis one is conducting at that moment. Time cannot be a factor. Place cannot be a factor. Ease and comfort cannot be factors. 
Body contemplation should occupy every breath, every thought, and every movement until the mind becomes thoroughly immersed in it. Nothing short of total commitment will bring genuine and direct insight into the truth. When body contemplation is practiced with single-minded intensity, each successive body part becomes a kind of fuel feeding the fires of insight meditation. The investigation then becomes a conflagration consuming the human body, section by section, part by part, as each is examined and investigated with a burning intensity. Regardless of how long it takes or how difficult the work proves to be, body contemplation must be practiced relentlessly until all doubt and uncertainty have been eliminated. As I'd come to expect, not everybody was happy with my way of teaching. The monks from Asokarama Monastery had joined me with good intentions, but their energy and enthusiasm soon faded under the pressure of food reduction, sleep deprivation, and intensive meditation sessions. Some of them became hooked on pleasant experiences in samadhi meditation that allowed them to forget about the stress and hardship of monastic life. Between meditation sessions, they felt free to let their minds drift off into pleasant reveries. They failed to grasp that samadhi is not the end result, that samadhi on its own does not have the power to eliminate suffering. I gave those monks an earful of warnings about the pitfalls of samadhi. Although the calm and concentration experienced in samadhi do form a firm foundation from which to launch an all-out assault on the defilements that cause suffering, the samadhi experience itself can be so peaceful and satisfying that a monk inadvertently becomes addicted to it. Soon his meditation loses its edge. Because his mindfulness isn't honed to sharpness and his effort isn't wholehearted, he remains trapped at a shallow level of snooze samadhi. When mental acuity and precision slacken, meditation often reaches an impasse. I tried every trick I knew to wake those lazy monks up from their samadhi slumber. I taught them to use the repetition of the meditation word budo as though it were a file used for forming and smoothing the coarse surfaces of the mind, until they form a sharp, concentrated edge capable of slicing through the fog of their daydreams. That single-minded focus would then be emboldened to test its strength when its mindful attention was centered on penetrative insight practices like body investigation. Combining strong-minded concentration with a variety of wisdom practices would prevent samadhi from losing its edge and exhausting its strength. In fact, the strength of samadhi's concentration was enhanced by the mental precision needed to scrutinize the human body down to the last detail. In the end, the powers of concentration and wisdom combined seamlessly to blaze a monk's path to release from the bondage of sexual craving. My efforts to establish Jnana Sangwara Monastery as a training center for practicing monks met with mixed reactions. Some monks put all their energy into following my instructions, and the results were encouraging. Other monks tried just as hard but failed to make significant progress because the headwinds of their old habits were too strong. The monks who refused to accept the strict discipline complained vociferously and threatened to run away. Some became so upset that their faces flushed crimson, trying to hide their frustration with long hours of seated meditation. Other monks simply nodded off during meditation sessions, remaining dreamily unaware. All those monks were my charges, and I took my responsibility to teach them seriously, whether they showed enthusiasm or not. I considered all of us to be fellow descendants in a John Mons Forest lineage. If I was harsh on them, it was only because I wanted them to experience the fruits of the Buddha's path to freedom. For two years, I managed to maintain the strict monastic routine typical of forest monasteries, I policed the grounds every day, making sure all the monks were awake on time, keeping watch over their comings and goings during daylight hours, and leading them through long meditation sessions at night. On those occasions when we gathered to carry out maintenance work or other manual labor projects, I set the tone by personally grabbing a tool and setting right to work. 
As an example for the laggards and an inspiration for the diligent, I often worked so hard that very few of the young monks could keep up with me. The situation wherein some monks constantly struggled with this monastic lifestyle while others persisted admirably in their efforts was not unusual in a practice monastery. A group of young men hailing from differing backgrounds, with diverse characters and temperaments, varying mental capacities and latent virtuous tendencies accumulated from their past comma, were bound to adjust differently to a fixed, unvarying program of strict discipline and intensive meditation. I felt I had to create a favorable practice environment and enforce a meditation program worthy of the most conscientious and committed of my students. I saw no reason to compromise these principles, no need to sacrifice intensity just to placate the stragglers. But a rigorous practice routine required ample opportunities for seclusion and solitude. Any disturbances to the monastery's peace and quiet were unwanted distractions. When I first moved to Nyana Songwara Monastery, the location was isolated and relatively unknown. A quiet calmness pervaded the whole area. That peaceful atmosphere began to change during my third year in charge. By then, the monastery had begun to attract attention, both locally, due to respect for the practicing monks, and more ominously, in the Bangkok metropolitan area, where Somdet Nyana Sangwara had taken pride in my success and started encouraging his disciples to pay me visits to learn more about meditation. On top of that, due to the Somdet's close connections with members of the royal family, plans were underway to merge the 1,000 acres of vacant land that the Thai king possessed with the 150 acres inside Nyana Sangwara Monastery, expanding the property and the resulting responsibilities immensely. These issues came to a head when a senior monk from the administrative hierarchy traveled down from Bangkok to pay a visit with an entourage of lay supporters trailing in his wake. Most of his followers were high-ranking ladies boasting royal titles or lofty social positions. Many of the rest were professors, doctors, or other intellectual types. It happened that the senior monk in question had a reputation for performing seances for the wealthy. That foolishness was the preoccupation of the gaggle that followed him. Instead of coming to the monastery to make merit by practicing meditation, these idiots came for the avowed purpose of taking advantage of the monk's psychic abilities to communicate with spirits of the dead. They intended to spend their time engaged in this bullshit, even though the monastery was well known as a haven for meditators. I've never allowed anybody, regardless of their reputation or rank, to ride roughshod over the ethical principles that I hold dear. No one is granted that privilege. My reaction to the seances was swift and decisive. As soon as I saw the rogue monk holding a meeting with his fan club in the main pavilion, I walked in and lambasted the monk to his face in front of everyone. You damn scoundrel! You've barged into my monastery uninvited just to trample on the virtues you vowed to uphold as a monk. You should be ashamed of your ignoble behavior. Shocked by this intrusion on their get-together, genteel ladies and cultured intellectuals alike scattered in different directions as the surprised monk's face turned pale. This old monk will not tolerate conduct that violates the disciplinary rules laid down by the Lord Buddha and followed religiously by conscientious monks ever since. This monastery is not a rubbish bin for cast-off rules and discarded virtues. It is a garden for cultivating goodness and merit. You've worn out your welcome here. I expect you and your group to be gone before the end of the day. I heard later that the socialites in Bangkok were angry at my uncouth reaction to the visit of a highly celebrated monk and his retinue of distinguished guests. Such is the price we pay to uphold Dhamma principles in the face of worldly misconduct. Incidents like the one I've just described eventually convinced me that I needed to find a place of my own where I was beholden to no authority other than the principles of Dhamma and Vinaya. Motivated by that resolve, 
I returned to Asokarama Monastery during my third year of service to request that I be relieved of my duties as abbot and supervisor of Nyana Sangwara Monastery. After detailed discussions with the relevant Sangha authorities, they agreed to find another experienced monk willing to replace me and carry on with the development of what was becoming a royally sponsored monastic center with grand expectations, a project in which I wanted no part. Instinctively, I had always been drawn to wilderness locations that provided seclusion and refuge from the world's messy compromises. So, after a short stay helping with teaching duties at Asakarama Monastery, I started to travel again. Due to my age, I was 62 years old by that time, and chronic physical conditions that limited my mobility, I was willing to accept rides on my travels around the country. Trekking along forest trails was reserved for wilderness areas where motorized traffic was impractical or impossible. Out of undying respect for Ajahn Lee Damodaro, whose memory I always kept close to my heart, I headed for Chinle Mountain in Lopuri Province just northeast of Bangkok, a locale where Ajahn Lee had wandered Dutanga and established a monastery almost 25 years earlier. I intended to retrace his steps through the mountains and visit that monastery to honor the senior monk who had urged and emboldened me as a young monk to seek out a John Mond in the wilds of Chiang Mai. I've never forgotten the kindness and encouragement he showed to a raw recruit in the forest tradition. In many ways, a John Lee was everything that I was not. As a teacher, he was always conscious of his audience and ready, on the spur of the moment, to adapt his language to the level of the people to whom he was speaking. With farmers and traders, he bantered fluently in the Laotian dialects of his northeastern homeland. With shopkeepers and government officials, on the other hand, he conversed in Thai, the national language, like a native speaker. When addressing members of the Bangkok elite, he knew all the refined and polished idioms and always spoke appropriately for the occasion. He had encouraged me to follow his example, but soon realized I was a hopeless case. The communication skills that he'd mastered just didn't come naturally to me. Comparing my own rustic style to a John Lee's elegance and erudition was like comparing a smelly pile of shit with a well-manicured flower garden. In everyday conversation, I tended to address people with blunt and folksy language. When principles of Dhamma came up, however, my discourse became more deliberate and restrained, and my manner more circumspect due to a profound respect for the value of the Buddha's teachings. At the same time, my tone was usually serious and direct. I didn't like to sugarcoat my message. Experience taught me that the best way to get the listener's attention was to punch them where it hurt most— then they would wake up and start to really focus on what I was saying. On the other hand, if I was in the audience when another teacher spoke on Dhamma themes, I listened quietly and didn't interrupt. I still felt like a student of practice and wanted to learn more whenever I had the chance. From Chinle Mountain, I journeyed further northwest to Tok Province, a mountainous wilderness district on the Burmese border. Several of the monks who had trained under my guidance when I was the abbot of Crystal Mountain Monastery in Chantaburi had already put down roots in the area's vast jungle. I struggled to walk through the boulder-strewn terrain to reach the sites where they had built monasteries and forest hermitages. The dense, almost impenetrable forest reminded me of my years practicing with Ajahn Mond in the uninhabited, inhospitable wilderness areas of the north. The austere environment in Tok province recalled years of internal struggle when only enormous effort, strict discipline, and unwavering determination allowed me to survive the ordeals and become a standard-bearer for wilderness monks everywhere. It pleased me immensely to see disciples I'd trained from an early age become rightful heirs to the legacies of monks like Ajahn Mon, Ajahn Kao, and Ajahn Li. These disciples had taken the untamed wilderness as their home and refuge while training a new generation of practicing monks in the tried-and-true meditative lifestyle pioneered by Ajahn Sao and Ajahn Mon, the grandfathers of the Thai forest movement. Even in the modern world, which had increasingly lost its reverence for nature's sanctuaries, 
resilient pockets of dedicated forest monks continued to buck contemporary trends while living and practicing quietly on the borderland of modern society. I envied their independence. My body could no longer endure the physical punishment that this mode of living entailed. My days of indefatigable vitality were slowly coming to an end. Aware of my penchant for living in caves, my disciples arranged a trip north up the Ping River, which flowed down from northern Chiang Mai through mountainous regions where age-old cave sites abounded. The steep cliffs that jutted out over the river basin and the mountains and valleys stretching back beyond them acted as a natural barrier separating the primordial landscape from modern-day development. Along the length of the mighty Ping, hundreds of ancient monasteries and stupas had fallen into ruin, their material remains scattered throughout the river valley. Human settlements were sparse in this interior jungle. We relied for our alms food on the families of fishermen that eked out their subsistence while living on raft houses moored in small, sheltered inlets recessed into the riverbank. Trudging slowly along the bank of the wide river, we heard the trumpeting sounds of wild elephants that had come down to drink and bathe at the river's edge. Schools of colorful fish were visible swimming just beneath the surface of the glass-clear water. The forest came alive each morning with the hooting and screeching cries of monkeys and gibbons that reverberated through the canyons in the early daylight hours. The midday air pulsated with the buzzing, shrieking, and hissing noises of countless varieties of insects. The menacing growls of clouded leopards heralding the onset of darkness alternated with the loud, abrupt noises of their prey, the barking deer. From one sunrise to the next, the forest resounded with activity. When we reached the Lee district of Lum Poon province, our party of Dutanga monks turned away from the river trail and hiked over the steep hills to the east and down into an adjacent valley. We were searching for the entrance to Chang Rong Cave, once the spiritual center of a long-forgotten Buddhist civilization that flourished at the peak of human activity in the Ping River Valley. On the floor of the large cavern inside that cave, an ancient ruler had built a small pavilion supported by huge golden teakwood timbers. The pavilion's floor was made of golden teakwood planks, polished smooth by centuries of bowing to the cave's many Buddha statues situated in niches along the walls. Its roof, covered with teakwood shingles, fit snugly under the cave's arched ceiling. Sturdy wooden dowels pounded into the timber joints held the structure together. On the ground beside the pavilion lay an ornate wooden palanquin used in olden times to transport distinguished patrons. Every nook and cranny in the cave's walls housed a Buddha statue, some large, some small. Many statues had cracked or broken over the centuries, and their missing limbs and heads lay scattered on the ground below. The overall effect of this scene had inspired awe and wonder in generations of intrepid pilgrims who had trekked through the wilderness to pay reverence. The evidence of human intrusion in the area was minimal. Chang Rong Cave's seclusion was almost complete. Since no roads in or out existed at the time, the only way for ordinary people to reach the cave was by riverboat. Even then, they were forced to hike in through the jungle and contend with the perils of wild animals and biting insects. Powerful forces of the natural world, both earthly and celestial, guarded the cave's privacy. Sanctuaries of Buddhist heritage like this ancient monument, lost in the overgrown jungle, still unspoiled and unaltered, have unfortunately become a rare sight even in a country like ours which boasts such a time-honored Buddhist culture. Living in the depths of the jungle at Chang Rong Cave coaxed my mind to reflect on the rapid changes that had taken place in the world since Ajahn Mun passed away. Large swaths of wilderness habitat had succumbed to the restless hunger of people of all classes seeking to take advantage of the country's natural resources for their own financial gain. From small farmers expanding their fields to greedy businessmen seeking profit from the logging of timber, 
Everyone encroached on the wilderness without feeling shame or hesitation about the propriety of their actions. The nation's wilderness areas were disappearing at a rate matched only by the proliferation of greed, aversion, and delusion in the confused jungles of its citizens' hearts. The wholesale destruction of our forests coincided with an uncontrolled expansion of the tangled undergrowth of mental defilements. All too often people believe the conditions of the earth can be changed to ensure human happiness, to provide jobs, and to create material wealth and a comfortable life. Everyone is trying to accumulate as much wealth as possible, but the search for material wealth and the quest for spiritual wealth are in many ways incompatible. Material wealth views the earth and its resources as commodities for human consumption and the harvesting of those resources as a human right. Spiritual wealth views the same abundant resources as a treasure to be safeguarded and a natural setting for profound spiritual experiences. Because monks initially come from the lay society, this materialist worldview has infiltrated monastic communities. The ensuing change in attitudes has been dramatic. My earliest disciples, who came to the monkhood from rural farming families, had only elementary or middle school educations. But they were accustomed to working long, hard hours in the rice fields during the planting and harvesting seasons. Never once to shy away from the demands of physical labor, those boys gave tireless effort to their tasks. Their thoughts were unruly but their hearts had the strength to buckle down and rein in the restlessness in their minds. Though not highly educated, they were smart in practical, common-sense ways. Quick to learn, they exhibited a natural cleverness in devising and applying new ideas. Being serious and well-intentioned, that first group of disciples was easy to teach using strict training methods that pushed them to the limits of their abilities. They were realistic and tough-minded. They didn't argue or talk back. Later, steel oxen replaced those of flesh and bone in plowing the fields and preparing the soil for sowing. Consequently, the sons of today's farmers engage in less physical labor and have more idle time to entertain social distractions. They study longer in school but engage less in religious activities. Their minds become so crammed with stressful thoughts on how to secure a wife and where to make a living that hardly a crack is left open to allow access for Dhamma themes to enter their consciousness. Even fundamental precepts of decent behavior are discarded by the wayside on the anticipated road to prosperity. If these young village men become monks at all, it's merely for a short-term stay to please their parents and fulfill some social expectation. With the advancement of higher education in subsequent generations, a new breed of young men shows up to apply for monastic training. These recruits represent a more educated and skeptical generation of young people who have been raised mostly in an atmosphere of indifference to the supreme virtues that previous generations had taken for granted. The comfortable, sheltered lifestyle youngsters enjoy nowadays makes them less fit and less inclined to tackle the primitive conditions of Dutanga life. Hiking on narrow, uneven forest trails, sleeping in mosquito-infested jungles, and subsisting on rough village fare. Reflecting on the future, I realized that the remainder of my life would be dedicated to introducing Thai forest practices to monks whose minds were trained in intellectual skills, but who were sorely lacking in basic survival skills. A forest monk must have the wiliness of a fox, the strength of an elephant, and the heart of a tiger to follow the Buddha's path to the end. Today's educational system doesn't teach those virtues. University graduates are often too smart for their own good. Their first challenge? They need to realize how stupid they truly are before they can bow down in earnest and accept their teacher's training. 